Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, thank you again for finding time to join us. So, um, well, I hope the week has been going well for all of you, and uh, we're just chatting with the easing of the recent COVID restrictions. Um, many of us are actually going back to our nine to five office hours today, driving to the office. Um, even the roads are getting busier now, <laughs> but yet I get to see many familiar faces today joining us for a virtual wine tasting with Klein Constancia. And um, well, um, who wouldn't? Klein Constancia is one of the oldest winery filled with history, filled with stories of many famed individuals. And this wine has been described many a thousand times of, as a magical wine, the most delicious wines in the world, the wine that you want to drink before, the, the 110 wines you want to drink before you, before you, you leave the earth. Mm -hmm. So why not? And um, today, we're very, very happy to have uh, Mr. Hans Anstrom. He's the managing director of Klein Constancia. And uh, he's, he was also Sweden's best Malia. And we're very, very honored to have his time to tell us more about this beautiful winery. So without further ado, Hans, um, can I hand the stage over to you now? Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um... If times would have been normal, I probably would have been seeing you all in Singapore, but nothing is normal right now. <laughs> the world is upside down, really. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm actually not even, even sitting at Klein Constantia today due to the seriousness of the, the COVID. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm actually in Europe. However, um, I'm going to bring you some, some news. I'm going to bring you a little video clip that, that uh, my team took last week. Uh, we have actually finished harvest uh, last Friday, Friday before Easter. So, so even if I would have been out there, I could have showed you some nice pictures walking around in the vineyard, but there wouldn't have been any, any action uh, harvesting. Uh, background, though, as you can see, is obviously uh, early morning harvest at Plan Constantia. Um, so I will start, I hope that some of you have been to South Africa uh, and to Cape Town and maybe even to Klein Constantia. It is, it is a beautiful place in the world and um, there is actually, when the world will open up, there is actually a direct flight with Singapore Airlines uh, to Cape Town. So maybe one day you will put it up on your, on your uh, list of travels once we can travel. So let me start with a little video clip, which is taken last week, and, and it just gives you an idea of, of the outlook of the estate and the vineyards. So here we go. Welcome to Clan Constantia. Very short, very brief. Uh, there's obviously the, the, the last grapes that we do bring in are, are the late harvest Muscat de Fontignon, which is for Van de Constance, the wine we're going to taste later on. I hope you could see the, the cloud cover and, and that the pickers were actually quite well dressed. When, when we speak about South Africa and, and our vineyards and, and what, when people travel to our place, often it's in our minds, we think that it should be warm and it should be lions and elephants and, and, and it's uh, very dry and all that. But, but where we are, and I will show you pictures shortly here and, and, and prove it to you, is it is actually, we're on the tip of Africa. If I stand in the vineyards where, where the video started and I look south, 
the next piece of land will actually be Antarctica. So huge white ice block, you know. So we are really at the southern tip. And in Constantia, it is the, the wettest, the coolest, and the windiest vineyard region in South Africa. And, and it is really is, it is a very cool sort of Mediterranean climate. And, and what Alice mentioned in the beginning, uh, she said a little bit about our history. And actually, the pictures that you saw now, the video of the vineyards that we have, that vineyard area is actually the, the oldest viticulture region in the whole of the Southern Hemisphere. So obviously Australia, they started more than 100 years after us, but also Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, they're all uh, much later than, than, than when we started for, for fairly obvious reasons. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna show you a couple of slides to put you into mindset about Van de Constance. And then once that won't take so long, and then once we've done that, we obviously have four vintage, uh, five vintages of, uh, that we're gonna taste, uh, which we will run through. Uh, and hopefully we will have um, some, some interesting discussions after that. So let me go in here, share screen. This is uh, our, our estate. Uh, this is a typical, what we call Cape Dutch house. And this is our old, old house. It's dating back to the, the very early 1700s. Uh, the building to the right side is actually the, the original wine cellar. And that is actually the oldest building on the property. Uh, we don't make any wine there anymore, but, but uh, if you one day you come, come to see us, that might be the place where we have lunch. So lots of history, too much. We would be here for days if I would talk to you all about the history. But, but obviously in the mid 1600s, the Europeans, whether they were Dutch, uh, Belgium, uh, English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, they all sailed down the African coast and wanting to discover the, the, the beauties of Asia, of course. And, and the rounding point, point for that was obviously the Cape Point, where today our vineyards are and, and, and Cape Town, the city. And, and that, it wasn't really meant to become a colony. It was really just a trading post for the ships to restock with, with food and, and, and water and probably, you know, wine as well. And, and also to change crews and to repair ships. And, and it was really a, 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 a very important, it was sort of halfway through. So it became very early, very, very important for, for all the ships going back and forth. And, and, and obviously, as we know, when, when the Europeans went around the world to, 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 to build these, these stations and, and colonize, wine was very important because it was part of the religion. So there was all, on the first ships traveling, there was always uh, priests and they always had sticklings of vines with them so they could plant uh, grapes so they could have wine locally wherever they settled. Uh, so we were, we were, we are, as you will see on some of our signs, we are dating back to 1685. This is a picture where you see uh, the, the, the Cape Point and where we are located is where this little red banner is. Uh, Cape Town would be up north of us. Uh, originally all the ships landed in this bay here uh, because it was more sheltered. Cape Town didn't have in the early days a natural harbor. So they, they landed the ships here and then they carted all the, the, the goods into town. On the left side, the blue is obviously the ocean. And on this side is actually the Atlantic Ocean. And on this side, on the, on the right side, it says False Bay down here. That is the last bit of the Indian Ocean. So most winemakers, and if you've been to tastings or if you travel New Zealand, Australia or in Europe, we love talking about 
the maritime influence to when we are growing grapes. And, and that can be a river, it can be a lake, it can be the Mediterranean, it can be lots of things. And for us at Klein, we actually, we, 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 we gone one step further than maritime. We are actually talking about two ocean influences. So we have really dramatic weather influence and, and from our vineyards, and if, if you take the little picture in the middle here, this is at the top of our vineyard. So the picture is taken maybe at 350 meters and I'm looking straight south, uh, southeast. And the ocean that you see here is the Indian. And, and that is about seven kilometers only. If I would turn around and I would face north, which would mean I face this way, that is again just seven kilometers. So we are really on, on a, on a re at the point and we have weather, wind, wet coming from every direction. This is looking almost north, northwest-ish. And, and the, the house that you saw in the first picture is down here, the cellars. And, and our vineyard starts here at the bottom, which is 30, 40 meters above sea level. And the picture that you just saw on the previous slide was taken up here. So that is about 350 meters. We are very much like a, I would say like a European domain or a state or a chat. We're not a chateau, but we're, we, every label that says Klein Constantia, all the grapes comes from this piece of land. They've been grown here, they've been made here, they've been bottled here. We do not take grapes from other regions and create blends, etc., etc. And the, the, the total amount of, of land that we have is, it's not big and it's not small, but it is 146 hectares of, of, of land, but obviously not of total vineyards. We're much smaller than that. We're, we're just about 90 hectares of vineyards. We, we grow, we are mostly famous, of course, for Vin de Constance, which is only made from one grape called Muscat, Muscat Frontignon. But we also grow actually much more of Sauvignon Blanc, which is sort of our little bread and butter product because Vin de Constance takes five years before we can sell it. Sauvignon Blanc, we usually can sell a year after having picked the grapes. We also do make a little bit of red wine. It's very little uh, and, and uh, it's more of a hobby activity, etc. cetera. Uh -huh. Here again, we're facing, you've seen sort of a similar, but you see it, the hills are so steep. So we have terraced them to, to, to protect the vineyards for, for if it rains a lot, so, so the, the, the soils are staying up there, erosion is always a problem. And also you see these vineyards here at the front, that they are sort of small bushes on a, quite a thick pole. And the reason why we like to cultivate like that is the winds are sometimes so strong. So it, it, it's better for the plant if they are sort of, they have something really solid to hold on to. So we do it sort of like bush wines or, or the French would call it gobli. And like that, we can protect them from the wind and they are much shorter and closer to the ground. Uh, and and it's, it, it, it's a way that works really well for us. It, it's more work, it's more labor, uh, but, but we will have really small berries, uh, very thick skins, and, 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 and the, 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 the bunches will be very, very tight. So that, that's why we have a, a wine that is very fresh and very savory naturally. There again, you see how steep it can be. We have about 110 people working in the vineyard all year around. And, and I mean, this is, this is an advantage of being located in South Africa. We, we have access to a lot of labor. And, and as you can see, since it's so steep, it is literally impossible to do anything by machine or by tractor. We use tractors as much as we can, but we really have a huge advantage 
um, we're having having labor in in the vineyards all year around. So I usually say we are not farmers; we are actually gardeners. That's that's how much love and work that really needs to go into the vineyard. Again, um, the way we farm is is uh, completely natural. So we are following some of the biodynamic principles. So we would we would not use pesticides or chemicals. Uh, in in all the way through the chain, uh, in the in the growing on the grapes, but also in the making of the wines, and and this is for us, to be perfectly honest, it doesn't make the wine taste better today. It, that the one who says that, I I would like to have a chat with, but what it makes, it preserves the soils in a better condition for the next generation or the years to come. And that is the key why, why most with most high quality wine farming today goes into the philosophy of, of being as naturally farmed as possible. And, and I think this is fundamentally important for the future. This is facing north. This picture could have been taken today. It, it is really autumn and you see the coloring is, is, is going red, uh, orange, and here we are facing up north in the vineyard. One thing that is very important for us is that uh, we are harvesting very early in the morning. Uh, we usually start around four o'clock. And, and there is predominantly two reasons for this. One, the grapes are naturally cold. So when they come down to the cellars, we don't need to chill them which is um, we, like, we like the grapes and the juices in order to be as cool as possible when we start the winemaking process. So if the grapes come in warm, normally the winemakers use some, some kind of chilling system to mechanically chill the, the juice down, which is quite, quite brutal to the juice. So we, we are picking it very early in the morning. So the grapes are coming down naturally cool. They sort of six to eight degrees only, and it works really well. And then another thing that is really good is it's much better for the workers. You know, it, it midday during harvest, it can be 28 degrees. So they rather harvest when it's eight, eight to 10 degrees. And they, they also like to go home early in the afternoon instead of being at work all day. This is a, a mod, we, are, we are very traditional at Klein, but we also use, of course, modern technologies. This is literally, it's a sort of a, a heat camera that flies above us. Uh, and it's a technology that, that gives us uh, the read of maturity of the grapes. Uh, so obviously, you know, green is not very ripe, orange is in the, uh, yellow is in the middle and, and orange is when the grapes are getting green. We have also other, other cameras that can see about water and, and, and mo soil moistures and so on. And this is part, part of the process we use when we decide when to harvest the grapes. Of course, we also measure the, 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 the grapes and, and send that to laboratory. And we, of course, we also taste the grapes to decide whether we, we, we should harvest or not. So it's, it's, it's a mix of um, human, human being, human errors, together with high technology. Now we're getting a little bit more serious. Vin de Constance is made from only one grape, Muscat de Frontignan. Um, often it's, it's misunderstood and people think that Vin de Constance is a Botrytis wine uh, or, or a, a noble, noble rot. Uh, it is not. So even if we are very often compared to uh, Sautern, like the likes of Chateau de Quem and Sudero and Rio Sec, we are, we are very different because we are only a late harvest style of wine. Uh, and here you see the grapes. And so we let them sort of dry up to raisins on the vine. And we would go many times and pick these grapes. So if I would... If I was picking on these bunches today, I would take the darkest berries possible. And, and we would take berry by berry 
and we would leave the ones that are a little bit more orange or yellow, we would leave them for another three, four days and then come back to pick again. So a very slow process, but a, a very similar process to how Sautern or Barsak is, is picked. This is quite an interesting picture. Here you really see uh, the differences in maturity and, and the one furthest to the left is, is obviously the least ripe. And there, you know, we, we would just wait. We wouldn't pick anything. The second one, there we start getting some raisins and we would go in and maybe pick dues. But we would leave that the, this right part here, we would leave all of it. Then we're coming to the third, you, you, you can almost pick the whole bunch. But at the top here, there is berries that are not ripe enough so we would leave them so here you see how they are and 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 uh as you can see it's a, it's a huge difference between the very unripe grape and the ripe grape uh, the grapes are picked in in as you saw on the film in little baskets and then they come down to the cellars and we hand sort them again and it, and this is just small details, but, but really important details. And, and the effect it has on the wine by taking away berries that aren't right or leaves or things that we don't want, just makes the wine more elegant. Uh, we, we ferment in a few different ways, but this would be a, a very traditional way of fermentation. So it's, it's a, as you can see, quite a big round open wooden barrel and and then uh, what what they're doing here they all the skins they are pressing them down so so we are, are macerating them further to get to extract more flavors and and what people aren't aware of is in simple terms it takes about three months to harvest the grapes for van der constance it takes anything between six to 12 months to ferment because of the sugar and, and, and the fermentation is totally natural, it's a very, very slow fermentation. And then after that, we are aging the wines for about three, three and a half years in barrels before they come out to the market. Uh, this is just some not so romantic pictures, but they are from the cellars. And, uh, we all have our own ideas and philosophies and secret tricks on what's good in the cellar, et cetera, et cetera. But my personal view about a wine cellar, if you ever go to a wine cellar when you're traveling, you, you're interested in wine and so on, the number one thing you need to look at is, is it clean? It is fundamentally important for any winemaking facility that it is clean. It's, it's like a kitchen. If you go to the best restaurant in Singapore and you walk in to the kitchen, I mean, you will, you will be able to, to kiss the floor, but that's how clean it is. And a wine cellar should really be the same. It's really important. The second most important thing with a wine cellar is the logistics. And again, we can compare that with a restaurant kitchen. And that is the grapes need to come in in the right area of the cellar and the process needs to go through and eventually the bottle goes out at the end of the cellar. So you can imagine if I'm this very, very fancy chef at the very best restaurants and I have a beautiful plate that I'm just going to give to the, to the waiter to bring to the service and I realized that I've forgotten to put something on it. So I take the plate back, I put it back two stations, they put a tomato on the plate and then the plate comes back and it goes to the waiter that maybe only took 20 seconds or 30 seconds but now if it was meat or fish or whatever on the plate that has for instance now had 30 seconds to get cooler not to have the exact temperature that i had intended when i was doing it the first way so very small details can actually impact the wine quite dramatically here you see some of the, we also, this is what I call, I call uh, old tech. And, and we, we actually utilized, we have stainless steel, we have beautiful barriques.
but I wanted to introduce uh, the way that Van der Constance was done two, three hundred years ago. So we have, since 2015 vintage, we have introduced these big barrels, which is the way that all wineries, all wines were aged or fermented hundred years ago, before the, bar uh, the, the, the barriques, as we call them today, we really introduced. So these are predominantly for, for aging of Van der Constance. And again, cleanliness is important. This is my team uh, and, and uh, you know, everyone is important and we, we do absolutely love them and we look after them. Uh, we're going to taste today five wines and, and um, here is, we are very fortunate. We, we, the wine gurus of the world, they sort of like us. We, we get nice reviews and nice scores. And here is just uh, some of them, you know, but, but normally, normally we, we, we get disappointed if we aren't at the top of, of, the, of the 100 scale, so to say. And then finally, I hope to see you in our vineyards, in our little tasting room. We even have a little restaurant where we can have lunch one day when the world is a little bit more normal. So that was the little um, introduction to Klein and to Van der Constant. <laughs> Any questions on that before we we, we sort of move on. Yes, uh, there's actually uh, one question here coming from weeks ago. And the question is, when did the biodynamic practices start at Klein Constantia? 2012. Okay, short and simple. We, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite recent and, and it, it's very simple. Um, I explain a little bit the, the the history of Klein Constantia, it, we have a lot of history. We, start, we started in 1685. We had an amazing period. We be, became incredibly famous in Europe in the 17 and 1800s. We were, I mean, there were, we have records when the wines are served at Buckingham Palace, at Versailles in Paris. The wines are drunk by George Washington, but then, Come middle of the 1800s, there was a, a lot of uh, uh, issues in, in the world, actually. But, but in South Africa, we had disease in the vineyards. We had wars. Uh, there were a lot of wars coming in Europe, of course. And at Klein Constantia, we actually did not make wines between the late 1880s to 1986. So we, we lost 100 years of winemaking in our life. In uh, 1979, a South African family bought Klein. It literally had only four hectares of vineyards. Everything was overgrown and, and left abandoned. So, so they started to invest and to, to renovate and to replant. And, and in 1986, they made the first modern time Van de Constance again, having been literally lost for 100 years. This family did an amazing job and they, they really created completely Clan Constantia as it is today. But in the late 2005, six ish, the, the old man who had bought it, he, he, he decided to sell. He was all tired and, and didn't really know about his family succession. So we actually bought the property in 2011. So the way that we saw Klein in 2011 was a fantastic jewel, some of the best terroir in, in South Africa, if not the world, a very famous heritage and a unique wine, Van de Constance, but it was a little bit tired. It was a little bit dusty. It was sort of like, like that restaurant that had been closed for a few years, but, but had still the best location and really great name, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we came in 2011 and since then we have converted vineyards, we have rebuilt the cellars, we have uh, 
fine tune every little detail on how you can improve making small improvements. And that's where we are today. Sorry, long answer on, on a short question. Okay, thank you very much. And there's another question here uh, coming from Nicola. And she asked, how original is the wine today from when it was made in the 18th century? Are there any differences in what we are drinking today? You know, one, one of our dreams is, is to try to make the wine as authentic and as close as possible to the wines 200 years ago. So when what we have done the last 10 years, we have, we have opened up, believe it or not, some old bottles all the way to 1791. Uh, so, so, and when we open these very old bottles, we obviously analyze them. So we take, take some of the leftovers and we send it to laboratory to see the, the composition of, of, of the wine. And to be perfectly honest, I think as we are now, you know, coming 2018 vintage, I think we are actually very close to the way that the wines were made in the middle of the 1800s. Uh, and 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 th that's that's our goal. We don't we don't want to make we if we can make remake the authentic old wine. We are much happier than trying to make something new because it is such a unique wine. Okay, next question is coming from Mr. Tim Waget. Uh, Tim. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm just very curious on that point. That the bottle is so unique. Can you just talk a little about that because that to me is one of the things that is so evocative um and and i just pulled the you know copy of it from the website i i don't ever get tired of looking at it i i just think it is wonderful yeah i, I mean I, I can't claim to have any any input on the general design of the bottle because that was the former owners who did something incredibly clever there was no, I mean, the old cellar was there, but, but they were, there was literally no stock of the old bottles, but they found a few. And, and, and the bottle shape is today a reproduction of the bottles that were used at Klein in the early 1700s. And actually, believe it or not, the original bottle came from Denmark. There was a very famous Dutch trader, with, he had lots of ships, and he convinced the owner at Klein that he should start early chateau bottlings, and they started that already in the 1720s. And, and so, I mean, way ahead of, of uh, European vineyards or, or chateaus in Bordeaux when they started to bottle. So the, the very, very best wines from Klein Constantia were shipped as in this bottle, bottle at the estate. Uh, while normally in this time, the wine would have been shipped in barrels on the ships, landed up in Europe, and then maybe they were bottled or they were sold again in another little barrel and so on. So, so it is original bottle, reproduced. Sadly, we can't make it in South Africa because we haven't got a, a, a glass manufacturer that can do it for us. So they we have to import them from Italy. And it is our own bottle. It's our own trademark. So if you see anywhere another wine in this bottle, it's a fake. And it's fascinating. And, and, and the other quick sort of supplementary is when I look at it, at the bottom left, you've got that kink. And I'm yeah. just curious, is, is, was, is that simply a unique way at the time of representing the bottle or is there a practical benefit to it? Because I would have thought, counterintuitively, it's not helpful for storing on its side. <laughs> you, you actually, it works laying them down. It's not a problem. But okay. what, what we wanted to do is, in, in the 1700s and the 1800s, uh, all the glass, of course, was hand-blown. And that little uh, skirt, that little kink at the bottom is when, when the glass obviously was... was was hot because it was in the fire. He took it out on, on that little stick ah, where the glass was sitting. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the glass mass not being cold yet shaped that when due to the movement. 
So that's what we have been trying to recreate. Ah. So that's why the bottle is not asymmetric. Yeah, thank you. Sm small details make, makes a huge difference. But it's a wonderful <laughs> part of the story. Yeah, oh no, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Maybe now we can proceed with the tasting. Uh, first one will be the 2017 vintage. So what I think you all should do is taste this wine normally. I will be quiet, and and uh, and 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 sort of try to figure out what you, what you like or what you dislike with it. And then I'm I'm not really here to tell you how good the wines are because I'm obviously biased. You know, I I live and dream these wines every day. But what I can tell you about each vintage is what we think is good or less good in the wine, and and how the vintages have made the wines the way they are. So let's start with the 17 and, and we, we get going here. Would you like to share with us, um, just a little bit of recap, what was 2017 vintage like? I will. Okay, so 2017 is, is for us, it's actually quite similar to this year's vintage, 2021. It's, it's a very slow growing season and this we like. We, we want, you know, fr from the day of the flowering of the plant until we have a grape on the plant to pick, we usually say we need about 100 days. And, and we, want, we want the slower this is, the better, because you have more aromatics in the grape. And, 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 but of course, you know, a, a, a cool year, uh, slow growth will then naturally give a more elegant wine and a wine with more freshness. So 17 is cool, fresh, aromatic, um, but in all the wines, the, the secret of Van de Constance, even if it is a wine with sweetness, is the, the freshness. And of course, this freshness is completely natural. We don't, we don't add acidity to make the wine lighter or fresher. It is completely natural. And, and that is the key. So very often when we drink the Van de Constances, to a certain degree, I like to say, they are actually dry wines with sweetness, not sweet wines with freshness. And, and in all the wines that we have, of course, 2017 is, it's really a very, very young baby. And it's a wine that is light, fresh, almost juicy. Uh, and, 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 and that is, you know, if you would wait another year, which will be the 16, the wine obviously settles down and it become richer and warmer and spicier fairly quicker. And, and that happens fairly quickly in the early, so I would say in the first five years. So between 17 and 11, you, you will feel this, this change, this transformation of, of becoming every year a little bit more mature. Okay, someone is asking, what is the residual sugar? Do they want to guess? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Annette, do you want to unmute yourself and guess? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't worry. Um, you know, the perfect wine, it's like a table. It has four legs. And each leg has to be exactly the same height as the other three. Then you have something that we call balance. So for us, the four legs is the sugar, the alcohol, the, the freshness, the acidity, and of course, the flavor, the extract, what you taste. And we call the balance, we call it sort of the sweet spot. What is the sweet spot? And the, the key to work this out is roughly around 160 grams of sugar. That is, that is sort of the, the, the balance of, of the residual sugar, which is quite high, but not at all as high as some other very famous sweet wines. Well, actually, Annette got it right. <laughs> well done. That's good. Really good. Um, but but it's, it's very deceiving because, 
to to guess the acid uh, to guess the sweetness of any consonants because the acidity is so high, it is so fresh. Uh, I mean, like like similar to what you have when you have great German beer analysis or trocken beer analysis. If they if they have a lot of acidity, um, it's really hard to say whether they have eighty, one hundred and twenty, or or two hundred and forty grams of sugar. For me, the 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 most important thing in in all vintages of van der Constans is the alcohol level shall not go above 14. If it does, we have failed completely. And, and what happens then is the wine becomes too big. It, it's sort of like it's been too much to the gym and, and it's too powerful. And the shoulders of the wines, they, they, it sort of just makes the wine a little bit heavy and a little bit tired. And you know, if you very often when you drink a, a wine with sweetness um, and you say, oh, wow, this is interesting, very good wine, but what are we going to have now? Let's have something else because the sweetness is so rich. So we actually, we, it's a little bit almost complicated to drink just a little bit of it. But, but Van de Constance, it's a, due to its complexity and due to the freshness, it's actually a wine that many people are quite happy to have a couple of glasses of because it's, it's sweet, yes, but it's fresh. So coming back to 17, elegant, cool, fresh. And normally these cooler years, they produce characters that, that fall into the category of white. So if, if you feel that the wine is spicy, which it is, it would be white spices. It's not black pepper, it's white pepper, for instance. If you have a cool vintage and you're, you're thinking that the wine has peaches, it will be more white peaches than really red or yellow ripe peaches. And if you, some of you feel that there is some kind of flower character to the wine, which there is, it will be white flowers. Uh, and, and these are typical, the whiteness is typical characters that you, you get from the slightly cooler years. So if you would go now to 16 and try that, and you, you sort of figure out what is the difference between these two years, it will be the coolness of the vintage. 16 is a little bit warmer. So you will have slightly darker, richer, uh, 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 characters, whether it's on the nose or on the palate. But the underlining freshness is still there. There is one little secret tasting thing in Van de Constance. If uh, you ever somewhere are in a, in a dinner or in a wine tasting or a Zoom tasting and and you're tasting this wine blind. And how, how to remember Van de Constance and how to discover this blind tasting that this might be Van de Constance. And that is when you taste any vintage, I promise you. And just when you swallow the wine, there will be a little prickly, spicy feeling at the end of the tongue. Uh, it's, it, a simple way of describing it, it it's, it's a very savory character. It's a very savory feeling, but it, it's, a little, it's, it's, it's a little bit like an umami feeling. You can't really exactly say what it is, but it is a savory, prickly character, a little bit spicy. It, it, it's a little bit like um, if, if, you, if you eat Parmesan cheese, uh, Normally we, we grate it and we put it on pasta or we put it on whatever. But but if you if you have an eight well aged Parmesan cheese and you cut it and, and you look into it, you almost see the little crystals in in the cheese, and and they are the sensation to the, the umami characters that Parmesan has, and it's the same in in Van de Constance. Little prickly, little savory, maybe a little bit salty, and this is this is a really unique character from. Constantia and Van de Constance. And, and on 16, you, you should feel that fairly, fairly dominant, actually. 
It's interesting how you comment uh, 20, uh, uh, 17 and 16 in terms of um, the lighter white flavors to mm. a darker. Because yeah. when you put them side by side, it's very obvious. Day 16, you get orange peels a lot more stronger. Yeah. yeah. Um, then, then the 17. Yeah. Also in the, in the warmer uh, re, uh, years, uh, we get a lot of um, more spice. We get sort of, um, I mean, obviously in Asia, you have different spices to what we have in Europe. But in, in Europe, we would say North African spices. So like Moroccan spices. But I'm sure if you look at Asian spices, you, you will put it into a category which is, again, a little bit more spicy, a little bit more rustic spice instead of the, the lighter spices, you know, or the more aromatic spices. And um, do you think um, flavors like that is more dominant when it's the vintage characteristics or when the wine ages? So when we taste like the 11s and so on, would they, yeah. Let, let's wait and see. Okay, okay. <laughs> let's wait and see. And, and you, you, because these five years here are all quite different, but they're all really, really good vintages. And, and, and you know, we're talking minute differences, but Van de Constance will always have a vintage variation. No vintage is exactly like the other one. Which is, which is good. We like it that way. I mean, it gives us something to talk about and it gives us something else to remember. If the wines were the same year in, year out, it would actually be a boring wine. Yeah. Hans, you were saying that you were about to bottle the 18. So typically when you release, it's three years of age? Yeah, it's a little, uh, we're going to release 18 in September. Yeah, okay, yep. So, and, and in the old days, th this is a top secret, but it's the same for all winemakers. You know, in the old days, people weren't as uh, diligent in terms of bottlings and timings and things. So usually in the old days, they kept the wine, whether it was red wine or sweet wines or whatever, they aged it in the barrels. And once they sold, last year's stock and they needed to put new stock into the market. They took the wine out of the barrel to bottle it. So if, if you would drink a Van de Constance from 1987 or from 1992, the wine would not have stayed three years in barrel. It would have stayed, some of them would have stayed seven years in barrel because it was depending on the sales cycle. But we have, we have formalized this formula uh, because obviously if the wine stays three years or six years, that extra three years does not make the wine better. It makes the wine less good, actually, in our, in our belief. And it was the same great famous Bordeaux from the 50s, 60s, 70s. They, 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 did, they did exactly the same thing because it was more expensive to store the wine bottle than what it was to store it in the barrel. Okay, let's try 15. 15, now we are scaling back a little bit towards more of a cooler vintage. This is, in my view, is maybe the, right now, one of the more elegant vintages we have uh, on the market. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a wine that I love, uh, but why I love it is more, it's the first wine we made in the new wine cellar. So we had, we had all the, the toys and all the equipment and, and everything worked perfectly with the logistics and, and the things that we've been dreaming about for, since 2011 were suddenly all coming together in 2015. Again, a very, very fresh wine. Fifteen and be more like fifteen. Say again? Will the weather condition for the 15 be more like the 17? Yeah, absolutely. But now you start seeing the difference, the two years difference, uh, the, the longevity and the concentration and, and, and the, the viscosity of, of the 15. When you swallow or if, if you spit, 
when you have it at the back of your tongue, it just lingers, it just sits there. And it's sort of, it's quite, again, yes, you have the, the peels, you have the, the stronger characters, but you also have that, that sort of white, fleshy, ripe fruit. Maybe it's, maybe it's the richness, but I, I just feel on this one that the acidity is starting to, maybe it's, I was going to use the word dissipate, but maybe it's more just the sweetness is so rich and unctuous that that's taking centre stage. It just yeah. seems almost drier from an acidity. Yeah, yep. correct, correct. And this Good. is what I was alluding to earlier, and that is how the wine develops actually quite a lot the first five years uh, in bottle. And then once it's done that sort of teenage period, it's sort of, and you can see that hopefully when we come down to 211, the wines settle down and, and they are, they've, they've sort of formalized the way that they want to be. And then they will stay like that at least for another 20 years. Okay, team, I do have a question here uh, coming from Jocelyn. And the question is, what is the oldest vintage that you have tried before and how do the old wines taste? <clears throat> the oldest wine I have opened was 1791. And this is about five years ago. And, and the wine was thick like syrup, really thick, 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 but it still had some freshness and it had some, I would say like a, a very, very oxidized, peely, a bit, almost bitter character to it. Um, it was a really, it was not a great wine, but it was a really great experience. I have, however, had many wines from the 1800s. And I tell you, the last one I had was, I think it was 1875. And that 2016 is actually very close to that one. Uh, believe it or not, very close actually. Uh, and, and do these wines gonna age 100 years? I, I think so. I'm not gonna be around to drink them. And, and uh, you know, but, but I do think the beauty of Van der Constance is it's in, incredibly attractive when it's young. It's a wine, if you like to age wines at home, it's a really nice wine to have when it's between 10 and 20 years of age. And then of course, for the real crazy collectors, if they wanna buy these wines for their grandchildren, it will be a very safe buy because the wine will be great in 100 years time. What is the biggest format then that Van de Constance has bottled? Uh, Right now we're doing the normal bottle, which is 500. And we do a Magnum in the, in the same shape, which is a real Magnum, so one and a half liter. And from next vintage, we will come out with double Magnums. Uh, yeah, and again, the same shape of the, our own bottle, so to say. Um, and, and, uh, and, but you know, th these are more for, I would say fanatics or, or people really sometimes wanting to show off a very unique wine in a very large bottle or something. Uh, the best bottle is, is really, I can't, I see a slight difference that the Magnums are aging slower, but I actually quite like the little bottle to be for my, my, my personal, but you know, I've only been working with, Van der Constance for the 10 years. When I've done it for 40 years, I maybe have a different view. <laughs> yeah. Okay, shall we go to 14? Yes, and just Sorry, quickly before we do, when you open a bottle, 500 mils obviously is a great size. It's fine, presumably, to drink it over, you know, a number of evenings. But if you, oh. if, is there, does it deteriorate if you just put the seal back? Uh, or if you apply some egg on gas, is that going to allow it to at least stay in its sort of steady state? Not that I imagine, you know, because again, a larger format, I can't see you drinking that in, a day, in an evening, you know, one sitting. Whereas 500, a couple of evenings, you know, two or three nights, makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it's a great question. And it's a very important question. Uh, I have pushed it to the absolutely max. And I've had a bottle that lasted three months. Okay. But 
I, you know, I, I drank very little each time, put the cork back into the fridge, and I was the only one drinking of the bottle. Yeah. And, and then it lasted three months. I say fairly safely, if you, you pour a glass cork in, into the cold, it will last three to four weeks. Okay. Yeah, before you start seeing a little bit of fatigue, on, on the, particularly on the nose, yeah. But the yeah. wine is yeah. so robust, so it, it can, if you keep it cold, it will stay there. All right, 2014. And now we are, so we have 15 and 17 are fairly close, but we have, of course, much more richness in 15 due to the two years. Then we had 16, was a, which was a slightly... A more a robust vintage, a little bit warmer. Uh, and now we're coming to 14. So we have a wine with, again, another year. So now you, you think about what sort of vintage do you think this is now is? Is it the slightly cooler, fresher year? Or is it the slightly warmer year? And you, and you can, to simplify it, compare it to 16 maybe. So whether you think this is is cooler than 16 or warmer than 16. Okay, there's a guest here coming from Mimi from Epicure and her guess is cooler. Actually, uh, Mimi, I will, I will go with you. I think it's a cooler year. Very good. <laughs> Very good. It is not as cool as 17 and 15, but it's cooler than 16. So we have another, we have another level on our scale here now. But it's very easy to be fooled because it has another extra year in the bottle. But um, Hans, thank you very much for guiding us through showing the 17s, the difference between the 17 and the 16, and then the 15 and 14. I think, I think the way you presented the, 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 the vintages and the way you described the characteristic of the vintage is... is yeah, that's, that was really, really helpful. <laughs> you know, it doesn't help me sitting saying how good the wines are. I mean, you, you are all good. At, I mean, you're very experienced tasters. And what you think of the wine is your way of thinking of the wines. You know, I'm biased. You know, I'm, I, if I say it bluntly, I'm, you know, I'm paid to say the wines are good. But so don't, you know, don't believe everything I'm saying. But I'm not saying whether the wines are great or good or whatever, because it's a little bit unfair because, you know, for me, they're always great. And, you know, these are my little babies. And, and, and we are, we are in, 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 incredibly proud of, of what we are trying to do. At the same time as every year, we're trying to do better. And I think, I think when you talk to someone who will speak about their wines like their little babies, sometimes it's about um, being able to find a certain character, a certain incident that happens in the vintage, would you, would you be able to share with us like any vintage, like any incident that, that could remember? Because almost oh, wines okay. is like something which, um, they tell you what happens in the entire year, actually. 2015 is, is probably the, the biggest incident I've ever had in my, my whole life. And that is, we had a huge bushfire uh, about Clan Constantia, and, and the whole estate almost burned down completely. Uh, and, and uh, so, you know, we, we, fight, we, we fight the fires with helicopters and we bombing and all that. And, and uh, the whole, la the mountain that you saw in the pictures above us was completely burnt out. But, but I only lost two or three hectares of vineyards. Thankfully, you know, in the, in the very last minute when the farm was gonna burn up, the wind turned a couple of degrees and the fire went another direction. Otherwise, you know, we would have, uh, yeah, we, we wouldn't be sitting, I would be sitting here today, but I wouldn't have any wines to show you. Yeah. Thank, 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 thank mother, mother Nature for that. Yeah, it, it's and crazy. Right. Yeah. It's crazy. And what that taught me then, and, and it, was, it was really an eye opener. And then I had all my people and they all love what we do and they all live for what we do. And they were out there trying to fight the fire because we don't get any help from the fire brigade. 
the fire brigade, they, they help the houses, they, they help suburbia. But we are a farm, so we have to take care of ourselves. And all my people were out there fighting fires with no equipment. Uh, so it's sort of like we had garden horses, you know, and, and we had to spray all our roofs to, to keep them wet, you know, because the, 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 the little flames are coming through the air and all that. And we were fighting, we were fighting these huge fires uh, with, with equipment that couldn't even fight a little fire in my, in my paper basket at home, you know. So after that, we have installed firefighting training uh, firefighting vehicles, fighting fire protocol. We have invested in a lot of things that we never use, but God damn it, if I have another fire, we're going to fight the fire. Yeah. So, so you've got a whole new manual on that now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, oh, it, was, it was a shocking experience. Okay, so in regards with that story, right, uh, Nimi has a follow-up question, and the question is, with that bushfire, what time of the year was it? Any smoke taint? And how would you deal with it? We, uh, thankfully, no smoke taint at all. We had, it, it happened, uh, it happened the weekend of 10th of March, and, and it was a year where we had picked very early and we had only a little bit of red grapes still out there. Uh, and and uh, we picked them, but we didn't make any wine out of it. Uh, it wasn't really worth it. And, and they would have had taint. Um, and, and of course, you know, that taint, taint is a terrible issue with grapes. And anyone that says they can get the taint out of the wine, I think they are lying. Uh, you know, the very simple saying, dilution is the solution to a problem. But in wine with, with fire taint or smoke taint, you, you can't take it out. I, I have yet to see a wine where they've taken it out. And, and in America in particular, the last 20 years, there's been quite a few vintages where a lot of the red wines have smoke taint. And, and, and they have, University of Davies have spent gazillions on trying to figure this out technically, but it is, it's a really difficult challenge. And, and as of now, I don't think anyone have the knowledge or the technology to take smoke taint out. Okay, and before we proceed to the last wine, uh, let's talk more about Mother Nature. And the question is coming from Annette. And the question is, what challenges have climate change created and how does harvest date vary in warm versus cold vintage? Um, I mean, climate change is, is all around us. There, there's no question about this. Uh, for us, we are so fortunate. We get so much water, so much rain. We, we, I mean, the amount of rain we get in a year is almost as much as London gets. But that's our unique location. And that's why, for instance, I don't need to irrigate my vineyards. I'm, I'm one of the few winemakers in South Africa that do not water the vineyards. But, but, but you know, you're talking a little area by the name of Constantia where we are 10 winemakers. It, it's minute. If you go inland, to, to uh, Stellenbosch or to Schwartland or to Franschhoek, they all need to water the vineyards and they are running out of water. They, they, there is not enough water. So they, they have to figure out a way of, of putting in rootstocks that, that requires less water. They have to figure out a way of having a clonal selection that goes on top of the rootstock that requires less water. They have to figure out the right way of planting the grapes that requires less watering. And, and this is a worldwide issue. And, and the ones that can't figure this one out, they're not gonna produce grapes any, for much longer. What I see at Klein is, is, is that, yes, climate change have changed quite a few things, but I actually think we had more change out of the El Nino. And that, that was really, 
the biggest change out of El Nino was that we had literally no rainfall whatsoever. And we had a couple of years where we had severe drought. What I do believe for us is an issue with, with, with climate change, and that is we haven't got the same seasons. Uh, well, in Singapore, you, it, you have the same season all year round, but, but, but we, we, we used to have more definite four seasons at Clan Constantia and in the past when we look at the records. Now, so, so now the, it's, it's, it's more of a mix. And for us, this means, for instance, we used to get a, a lot of rain in the winter season, which is June, July, August, halfway into September. Now we get less rain in the winter, but we get rain every month. So we actually, like this year, 2021, we actually had quite a lot of rain in March and, and we were quite nervous about rot developing in, in the vineyards. But thankfully it didn't happen. So I think worldwide in vineyards, th there are a few, few challenges. And obviously one predominant is water. Uh, there is no water, so we have to figure out to grow grapes without water. Uh, and the other one is uh, regions where you are really dependent on, on seasons. Uh, wine qualities will change, you know. Uh, you take champagne, uh, cold, wet, uh, quite a complex region to grow grapes in with the climate warming or global warming and the climate changing, they will get riper and riper grapes, uh, at, which will mean they get, they get more and more sugar into their wines and they will get more and more structured wines than what they had in the past. Their way in the past of getting structure in the wine was to age them, but now they will get naturally a wine that, that actually is, is quite structured already after picking. There will be new wine regions uh, in, in really uh, extreme areas. I think, I think one, one interesting area that is developing is Western Canada, uh, Okanag Okanagan Valley, which is really extreme. And it's, in, it's, it, it's grapes grown in, in the desert, but it's a very cold desert. And they obviously have a lot of water that they can channel into the area. And they are actually now producing some really interesting wines that, you know, uh, Sonoma Coast or Russian River have been trying to do for years. But now these areas are getting warmer, while up in not further up north, they still have that cooler climate that, that California had 30, 40 years ago. All right. Shall we go to 2011? Yes. The last, but hopefully not the least. <laughs> and now you, now you're being so savvy on the vintages, so you will you will figure out where this one fits into the perspective. But just remember, obviously this is the oldest wine today. Uh, it's not very old, but but it's today it's the oldest wine, and 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 then you will have to place it in terms of the spectrum of the vintages. And then I will ask you that you rank the wines from one to five of your preference. You, you don't have to say anything what you like or dislike, but every time you drink your wine, you must so say, is this good, very good, or excellent, or is it not good at all? You make, make your own little, uh, little scale of what, what about the likability, and I like you to to grade my wines today. Which one you preferred and preferred less? Thank you. Okay, for me, okay, yeah, I will go closer to the 14th vintage, but with a um, the couple of years in it, the two, three more years in it, I find that it has developed a little bit of the nutty characteristics. That's for me. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, while everybody's still tasting, there's actually two more questions for you. Okay. I see here. Uh, I've seen about the one about diseases. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, main, the main disease we have is, is obviously related to humidity. Um, so, so we do get 
some of that. Um, we also, as you as you're well aware of, there is there is uh, quite a bad disease in in the in the leaves in South Africa. It's it's called leaf roll, and it 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 creates issues with the photosynthesis and and for the plants to to really reproduce and regenerate and all that. And 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 this disease. Um, Usually the vineyards are very young when they, they're very good when they're young. And then this disease sort of kicks in and, and the vineyards after sort of its 10th year or 15th year, this disease, it's sort of like a very slow strangulations of all the nutrients. Uh, and it, it makes it harder and harder for the, for the vine to produce really good quality grapes. Uh, you can still continue to grow grapes, and, but the wines, it, it, it is not the ultimate. So I usually say that when people talk about old vineyards in South Africa, they're not always necessarily better because of this virus. Uh, if they speak about really old vineyards that are planted in the 1940s or 1950s or 1960s, they can be absolutely sublime. But vineyards that were planted in the say 70s, 80s and 90s they would be quite affected by this leaf roll virus. The, the good news now is that in the last 10 years, South Africa have advanced very fast, quite dramatically. We have much better QC. The nurseries that are growing the rootstocks or, or the clonal selections, they are testing much more for this virus. So they aren't selling us already sick little vines. and and. So for instance, at Klein, we have actually, since 2011, we have replanted more than 30 hectares, more than one third of the farm in only 10 years. And that is because I believe that the quicker we can have really healthy, strong, the best of the best roots and clonal selections, the quicker we can be ahead of the curve to make really great wines. Um, so, so, and other than, than sort of, other diseases, of course, South Africa, like most other regions, other countries have had phylloxera. Uh, so, so, you know, we, we, there are, I mean, the phylloxera is everywhere in South Africa. Um, I was mentioning that our main, main, main issues in the vineyards is, is related to, to uh, humidity. And, and so we get, we get sort of diseases based on that. Thankfully, since we're so close to the, to the ocean, we get very strong winds. So if we have rain, clouds, we're sitting in the fog in the morning, usually by 10, the wind is back in and it blows it away. And that is one of the secrets why we can do these late harvest grapes that are, that are sitting still on the wine to a very late time of the, of the harvest. Right, 2011. What? How is 2011 versus 2015? There is a slight difference between 2011 versus 14, 15, 16, and 17. And that is, it has, not, it, it has all the characters of Van der Constance. It's actually quite a, a nice, soft, elegant wine. But it hasn't got the same precision. It hasn't got the, the same finesse. It hasn't got the same concentration. And, and this, is, this is obviously a little bit part of the old way that the grapes were grown and they were made and all that. So, so for instance, the difference in 2011 versus 14 and 15 would have been 2011, they would have picked the whole bunch. They wouldn't have picked the berries by berries. So, and then if you take the whole bunch, you still make a very good wine, but, but the wine is made sort of more of an average philosophy. And, and, and what we're doing now is we, we, we're picking the exactly the same grape with the same ripeness, and then we can utilize that by blending that back later in. But in 2011, there is, I don't say that the wines are diluted, because they certainly are not, but they are, they, they just, they are really nice wines, but they haven't got this, the same complexity at the same time as they haven't got the same elegance. Agree or disagree? 
Well, I, I went back to taste those three <clears throat> because whilst it's lovely to taste the 10 year old, um, I, I think you used the word elegant on uh, the 2015. Mm. And, and so for me, that, that's the best of the five um, with, the, with the 14 just behind it. Uh, and, and then of the two younger wines, I actually prefer the 17 over the 16, but I, I think it's just wonderful to, to um, taste them again. I, I was just going to mention, Hans, that I had the good fortune of visiting, and I'm just looking for my notes because I checked my database before we started. Uh, I've made one trip back in 31st of March, 1998. Oh, wow. It was the old, old Cellador, and this is a true story. And I knew about the wine coming from the UK, um, and I, as I went into the very, and as I recall, and the visual you showed earlier is very different from what I remember, but it was quite a dusty, dark um, cellar door. I went in and I knew that I was somewhere special because there were a group of Austrian winemakers who had just been given a bottle of the 93 and were leaving. And I picked up a six pack and took it back with me and I actually drank it from later that, about six months later, 98. So it would have been a five year, five years after release, after vintage, uh, through to 2006. And I just looked at the last couple of bottles. I actually had a couple of South African friends of mine who I gave, gifted a bottle to, so I enjoyed four. And it was fascinating to see the added complexity. And just from my own notes, I, I enjoyed uh, as it was 13, you know, 12, 13 years old, whatever. But it was just a memory. That's why no hesitation. And, and I'm keen to um, enjoy a couple more bottles of this because I just think it's divine. Yeah. Wine of the gods. Thank you. So 15, 14, 17, 16, and 11 is, is your way of looking at the vintages. 15, 14, 11, 17, 16, yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just really curious for, for me, I mean, my own view today, but take this with a pinch of salt because I, I am, as I said, biased. I, I love 17 because it's the latest baby born. You know, it's the youngest. It's, it's the one we last did. So that's all we have in our heads. Obviously, it's not the most exciting wine because it's too young. 15 drinks absolutely beautifully today. And that would be wine that I could just sit and sip by myself and, and enjoying it. Six, 16 is equally good, but it's just a little bit more richness to it. So that would be the wine I, I if I want to have a younger style of wine, I, I would have it maybe with some cheese or with something, whatever. 14 is a really interesting wine because it has a lot of really good characters but it's really hard to pinpoint the exact characters it has. It's a, it's a very, it's a very uh, complete wine, but it's, it's hard to pinpoint it. And it's, it is a, a, a very, very, it's, for me, it's very high on, on my likability scale, but I don't like it today as much as I like 15. But that, personally, I like the elegant, the more elegant stars. And then 11, which, which actually tastes very nice, but somebody wrote was the more straightforward. And I think that's a really good comment. It's, it's the, the, the character of this wine is, isn't, is, you know, it, it's straightforward. What you see is what you get, lacks a little bit of tact, a little bit of finesse, a little bit of um, balance, a li you know, but it, it, it's still there. But, but of course, 11, represents a little bit of the past while 15 onwards represents the future. Thank you, Hans. Uh, just one more question for Annette. Uh, was any wine made in 12 and 13? Uh, oh yes, uh, both. 12 is awesome. Try to get a bottle on it. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. Uh, but it's not as good as 15 but it's good. Uh, 13, yes, we made a little, no, we made very little wine in 12. We made a little bit more in 13. And it's a little bit like 14. It's sort of a, an in-between vintage, um, a, a little bit square in my view, you know. Uh, out of the line, it would be the one I like the least personally. Yeah. 
Yes. I agree with you, Annette, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so for myself, I think I will go for 17, 14, 15, 16, then 11. That's yeah. for myself. And um, uh, definitely like what um, they mentioned about the precision of the 17. Mm -hmm. Although it's a baby today, um, the notes that it's showing, the, the character, the, the precision that it's showing, the freshness, yeah, I think um, it's outstanding in this lineup. And I think all of us are looking forward to how the 17 is going to develop in, in the bottom. Yeah. 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 Give it a few years. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful wine to drink like it is, uh, but it, it would be a diff slightly different occasion. If you drink it now, it's a more casual occasion. So almost like an aperitif wine or, or with mixed food and happiness. And I mean, I, I drink it happily with spicy food. I like it with ginger and things like that. Uh, but it would be much more casual. Uh, if you keep it for five years, it, it's a slightly more serious occasion that you bring it out for. Indeed. Well, uh, before we end the session, um, is there any new developments that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> uh, I have shared you the double magnum. Um, uh, from, uh, from 2015, um, if, if you, where you did open up the corks in your offices, you should look at the corks pre-15 and from 15. And you will see that we are using a, a, a slightly different cork coming from 15, which I think is really important. And, and it's a cork, the corks are already pre-tested for cork tape. Um, and, and so we are, nobody is supposed to be able to say that Van der Konstanz has cork tape because all the corks have gone through a very slow and expensive sort of way of, of checking the corks because we're utilizing them. And, and it's, it's, a, it's one particular cork company that, it, that started this process. And, and, and it's a highly modern way of, of, of making sure that we haven't got wines with cork taint. And, and, and Van de Constance, we started to bottle with these corks from 2015 vintage. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's an, an expensive investment to protect the wines, to protect the babies. And I think it will all... So, well, um, and it's a wonderful wines. Like, I think, and I've spoken for all of us, wonderful wines, and thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Yes. And we shall see you in South Africa. Yes. Thank you, Hans. <laughs> all right. Bye for now. Bye.